Okay, so I think we should get started. I some folks might trinkle in. We know how it is with Zoom. Um, but for those of you who have, who have come on time, um, let's get started because we definitely want to end on time. I just want to welcome everyone to our CSEC prevention panel series, part one. Um, I'm really excited about this and we will, you know, we'll be talking about what are the best practices in preventing exploitation. And my name is Audrey Morrissey and I'm the Associate Director of My Life, My Choice and also National Survivor Leadership Director at My Life, My Choice. So I'm really, really excited that folks took time out of your busy schedule to join us today. I'm really excited about the panelists that we have today and panelists will discuss the state of exploitation prevention efforts nationally and the best practices that have come directly from My Life, My Choice exploitation prevention curriculum and prevention solution model. So first, just to talk a little bit about the panelists, our, I'll start with our guest panelists. Um, Catherine Chun, am I pronouncing her name right? Um, that's, that's good, thank you, Audrey. Thank you. I, it was my biggest fear. I'm like, I have to say her name right. Um, so moving forward, I could just say Catherine. Um, so just to kind of read Catherine's bio, um, Catherine is the Director of the Office on um, Trafficking in Persons. Catherine is the Founding Director of the Office of Trafficking in Persons and Senior Advisor on Human Trafficking at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HS, HS, HHS. Um, OTIP is part of the HH, HHS Administration for Children and Families responsible for developing strategies and implementing programs to prevent trafficking, increase victim identification and access to services and strengthen the health and well-being of survivors. OTIP also collaborates with government and non-government partners to raise public awareness, identify research priorities and inform policy recommendations to strengthen the, the nation's public health response to human trafficking. Catherine, welcome. And our other guest, Ken Klein, Housing and Emergency Services Vice President, uh, Valley Youth House. Ken received his degree in pastoral, pastor, he's a pastor. <laughs> I feel like these are, I'm getting tongue tied, pastoral yes. counseling yep. Yep. in 2013. He spent the first part of of his career providing therapy to foster care and homeless adolescents. Ken was focused on trauma care, including the use of TF slash CBT. Ken also worked as an addictions counselor focused on co-occurring disorders. Ken is now the vice president of, house, of a housing program which provides shelter services and transitional housing, life skills and clinical counseling services for approximately 200 youth in the north northeast part of Pennsylvania. Ken, welcome. We're very excited to have you. I also want to introduce um, Sherelle Morell, um, who is um, will be on our panel, who is um, Prevention and Survivor Leadership Management here at My Life, My Choice. Um, I didn't do bios. I figured I'd do the bios of our guests today. Um, and Kyle Munchkin, Director of Prevention at My Life, My Choice. And with that said, Sherelle and Kyle um, will, will um, tell you more about what they do um, throughout uh, this webinar today. Um, but I wanted to acknowledge our guests and speak for all of us uh, to say that we're really happy that you're here. Um, so let's just um, dive in. So Catherine, I'm gonna start with you. What is the national landscape around prevention of commercial sexually explo exploitation? Okay, thank you, Audrey. Um, so prevention, uh, I just put in the chat, a couple of years ago, our office came out with an information memo on principles and definitions related to human trafficking prevention. I highly recommend just um, uh, reviewing that as a resource. 
Um, but as at least at the national level um, within the federal government, uh, the, pr the prevention part of addressing trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation of children um, has had less focus historically than the direct service and aftercare part. Um, and then in the uh, recent years, we've been making a concerted effort to um, understand you know, the scope of prevention, what are the uh, best practices in related fields regarding intimate partner violence, child maltreatment, sexual assault, other forms of violence. And uh, we've been working very closely with our partners at the CDC um, because there are decades of research on what works to prevent other forms of violence and uh, what could be adapted to uh, work on human trafficking and um, CSEC issues. And so in this um, information memo, we talk about the importance of preventing both victimization as well as perpetration. Uh, there is a interagency working group to address uh, demand reduction for human trafficking. And uh, we're just, again, going through a learning journey of who's doing what um, on this issue. But one of the things I'll mention is that the follow-up to the memo that I uh, put in the chat uh, will be a broader prevention framework uh, we're working with the CDC. We identified eight strategies and 30 approaches for how we can have collective impact on prevention. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to put those eight broader strategies in the chat as well. Um, but more, you can find more information on our website. Um, and then specifically to prevention education, because I know that My Life, My Choice has done a lot of work in helping to uh, lead the field around prevention education in, in regards to child sex trafficking and CSEC. Uh, what we've been finding nationally is that prevention education programs have either um, been universal education or targeted. So universal, meaning every school age child in age appropriate ways should have some form of uh, prevention education. Um, and then uh, the need also for targeted uh, prevention education for those populations at higher risk uh, of experiencing trafficking and CSEC. Uh, last year, we uh, released a brand new uh, national uh, federal grant program around prevention education, and we hope that there'll be um, additional learnings coming through those programs as we evaluate them uh, this year and in coming years. Uh, we're noticing more attention at the national level, but also at the state level. For example, many of you are aware that in California and in Florida, they pass legislation uh, to require uh, prevention education of trafficking in schools. And so what we did was we kind of, we wanted to take a stock of what, what's existing regarding prevention education and how does it align with some of the standards that are out there, whether it's the CDC standards of uh, effective health education curriculum, um, there are these standards set by blueprints for healthy youth development. Um, there are national health education standards. And so later this year, we'll be coming out with a uh, full report on assessing existing prevention education programs. And in our assessment so far, we've generally found that sometimes people are confused around broader public awareness versus very <clears throat> targeted prevention education uh, curriculum for students, and I'm hoping other panelists may speak to that a little bit more. We found that many of the programs out there, um, although well-meaning, they lacked some type of theoretical justification um, of, of what the training's uh, main goals were. And um, often we found that some of the trainings um, lacked time um, and opportunity for young people and students to like actually practice the skills um, that the training was intended to have. And so um, those are some of the main outcomes. And then also another main uh, finding was uh, the um, lack of, <clears throat> or the need for a greater lens around diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, regarding prevention education curriculum. And then the final thing I'll mention at the national level is that the National Advisory Committee on the Sex Trafficking of Children and Youth in the United States Last year, or actually earlier this year, they came out with their final recommendations on what states can do to prevent child sex trafficking, inclusive of CSEC. And, um, and so this is going, if you're working 
um, at the state level or in uh, in connection or uh, in coordinating with ch state child welfare, education systems, your governor's offices, AG's offices, uh, please know that these recommendations are out there. And then the next step for this committee is to report out on what states are actually doing uh, to implement prevention efforts regarding child sex trafficking. And I'd be happy to um, respond to any questions later. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you so much. Kyle, there's a lot of talk out there about raising awareness about tra human trafficking. What is the difference between awareness and true prevention? So as Catherine was just touching on, um, the differences between awareness and true prevention, awareness can be thought of as kind of the first step. Um, it's the broad knowledge of exploitation and its impact on society and especially on the youth who are at risk um, and includes the risks that all youth face simply because uh, the commercial sexual exploitation of children exists. Raising awareness is very, very important um, and prevention can't happen without it, but it's just not enough. It really is kind of a baseline, just awareness for um, everyone who cares for youth, whether that's a family or service provider, um, schools, everyone who's involved in, in, a, in the lives of adolescents. Um, is, it's very important to have that awareness and it's really important for the youth who, who are affected by it to have that awareness. Um, but it is the kind of first, very first step, very first building block in true prevention. So if we move up from there, um, we think of prevention as going beyond awareness. It facilitates change through proven methods that target those most at risk um, before victimization and re-victimization can happen. Um, so prevention efforts focus on youth who haven't been exploited yet, but who are at the highest risk of exploitation for a number of reasons. Um, we know that youth in foster care and who are in the child welfare system are at high risk. We know that youth of color are at very high risk. Um, we know that uh, aspects like poverty, um, socioeconomic status certainly affects it. Um, so that's, that's hard data that does exist about um, the risks of CSEC on our youth. Um, we also focus on preventing the re-victimization of youth who have already been exploited uh, because they're at very high risk of being exploited again. So we'll talk a little bit more about our kind of public health approach to prevention a little bit later. Um, but prevention is really um, a comprehensive um, bringing in evidence, bringing in, um, you know, bringing in qualitative and quantitative evidence. Um, as far as being able to prevent CSEC among those who are at the highest risk of it. Mm -hmm. And Kyle, can I just, um, <clears throat> I just wanna add, have you kind of speak a little bit about, you know, cause when people say awareness, um, can you kind of share about like those one shot deals mm -hmm. and the, and real awareness? Can you talk about the difference between the two, please? Of course, so, so, um, Catherine also mentioned about kind of edu prevention education and what that looks like. And so a lot of prevention education, as she mentioned, you know, Florida and California have passed legislation that includes prevention education in health curriculum, uh, health curricula for students, which is great, which is a really, really useful tool. Um, it's not targeted toward the kids who need it most. So when we talk about a one-shot deal, like Audrey said, that's the idea of um, you know, all the kids in the school get an assembly talking about exploitation and they get that information. And as a one shot deal, it's a one time thing. Um, and in terms of health education, um, that can kind of be thought of in the same way, even if it is like a year long curriculum, because it is part of their health education. And it depends on, as everyone knows, the school district that you're in, how comprehensive a health curriculum is how long they get it, what the requirement is, if it's a year, if it's you know a semester. And it's very valuable to have that information within a health curriculum and it's a great start. Oh, I think Kyle froze. Kyle, can you hear us? You froze. The shame is removed and that dialogue can start between kids and their caregivers in order to really prevent exploitation. Thank you, Kyle. I do wanna let you know for a minute there, you froze, but um, are you frozen again? Did she freeze again? 
Yep, it's freezing. Let's see, let's give her a second to come back. There you are, Kyle. Every so often um, you freeze. Um, so, so which leads actually to the, to the next question when we talk about awareness and those one-shot deals. What sets the My Life, My Choice prevention, um, My Life, My Choice prevention solution model apart? What is it and how does it work? Okay. Um, I do apologize for the freezing. I think it is where I'm sitting in my house that's causing that to happen. Um, so our prevention solution model at My Life, My Choice um, is a comprehensive model of CSEC prevention for youth serving agencies that works to shift attitudes, knowledge, and skills on multiple levels. So we talk about a wraparound model of care. This is truly a wraparound model of care. Uh, it's through prevention groups, which we'll talk more about as well, um, that girls attend. Um, training for staff at all levels. Staff, Any staff who interact with youth should be trained on the principles of CSEC and how to recognize it, um, as well as policy implementation. So that's kind of the top-down aspect. CSEC prevention is addressed from all angles. So we see it as a blueprint for shifting behavior, practice, and policy, both from the ground up and from the top down, and it facilitates sustained system-wide change. Um, within the prevention solution model, all staff who interact with youth are receiving training um, in recognizing signs of CSEC and the language to talk to youth about it as well. So this is really everyone in a, in a program, if we're talking about congregate care, um, be, and we do talk about congregate care because youth in care are at the highest risk of exploitation. Um, so if we're talking about a program, we have, you know, everyone from, you know, cafeteria staff, safety, safety staff, custodial staff, healthcare, um, everyone, not just program staff, everyone who interacts with the youth should be trained in how to recognize this and how to talk about it among each other and with kids. Um, so that is one aspect of the prevention solution model. Another one is our exploitation prevention groups. And Sherelle is going to talk a lot more about that in a few minutes. Um, exploitation and prevention groups that the youth attend. So they gain those skills themselves. Um, and as well as uh, for administrators receiving training in how to enact policy, how to talk about this with staff, how to set the tone and really create a culture at the organization that will shift to weave in CSEC prevention and have that in all aspects of care. Thank you, Kyle. <clears throat> so Sherelle, one aspect of the prevention solution model is the exploitation prevention curriculum. <clears throat> Can you please um, describe um, what that curriculum is and how does it work? Yes, thank you, Audrey. So one part, one aspect of the prevention solution model is our 10 week prevention curriculum, which are 75 minute sessions per week for female identified youth 12, 12 to 18. Um, the group is for girls who have been exploited or high risk of exploitation. So in each session, we address direct, um, exploitation directly, healthy relationships, self-esteem and sexual health. Um, those are just some topics that we cover um, within our 10 week prevention curriculum. Thank you, Sherelle. Um, this next question um, is for Sherelle and Kyle and it's a two part. So I'll just ask one question at a time. Why focus on, on girls most vulnerable to exploitation with your prevention model? Kyle, do you wanna start? Um, Sherelle, did you want yes. to speak first? Okay. Um, yep. Yes. Um, so actually, I just wanted to add to the, the last question, if that's okay. I'm sorry. Um, so again, with the um, prevention solution model, um, our 10-week prevention group, um, we know that it works. Um, there was a three-year evaluation done over 350 youth that went through our 10-week prevention group. Um, and we're so excited to talk about the results. Um, we know you talk to each other and we found out after the study that there were um, 100%, the youth were 100% more likely to tell a friend, sister or someone that they know. And also um, the experience of exploitation decreased 50% after the group. So I just wanted to add that, sorry, Audrey. Thank you, very important, Cheryl, very important. So do you wanna, um, 
because I'm going to ask this question of you and Kyle both. Uh, you can start. Um, why focus on girls most vulnerable to exploitation with your prevention model? Okay, thank you. So we know that most female identified youth ages 12 to 18 are at high risk of being exploited. And we also know that those that are in the foster care system are, are at even higher risk um, of exploitation. Kyle, do you want to add to that? Yeah, so we do use a public health framework in our prevention solution model. Um, we, we talk about secondary and tertiary prevention. Um, and when we're talking about that in terms of public health, um, secondary prevention is uh, prevention that targets those who are most at risk. And tertiary prevention targets is prevention targeted at those who uh, a condition, if we're talking about public health, a condition may already have happened too. So translating this into CSEC prevention, um, we use secondary prevention to address the needs of the girls who are at the highest risk of being exploited for the first time and those who have already been exploited. So that's our secondary and tertiary prevention um, because those are the kids who are at the highest risk. Thank you. And I'm gonna ask the second part of this question of both of you, Sherelle, I'll start with you. Is it, is it a girl's responsibility to prevent their own exploitation? So it's the responsibility of the people who care for that individual youth to prevent them from being exploited. And not only that, it's the responsibility of the adults buying um, these youth um, to not buy them. Um, it takes a community of people uh, to interact with the youth so that a youth can experience growth in a safe and healthy environment. Thank you. So you're saying like we should all, all we all, we all, we're all responsible um, to make sure that um, the youth is not being exploited. It's our responsibility. Yes. Thank you, Sherelle. Okay. Sherelle answered that perfectly. So we'll move on to the next question, which is for you, Sherelle. What is it like to facilitate an exploitation prevention group? So um, to facilitate a prevention group, which I love, um, um, as a survivor mentor, I may go to group homes, schools, or um, any kind of community setting. Um, this is like an exciting part um, of my job. I love to teach the youth about prevention and exploitation and what that looks like. Um, so to talk a little bit more about it. So we have an activity that we do, it's called um, Anatomy of a Pimp. And the girls will talk about what they think a pimp looks like um, or an exploiter. And then we give them the facts on what that exploiter um, will look like for this day, like today, 2021. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess too, um, folks will probably wanna know, Sherelle, how do girls respond? Um, to this uh, prevention group? How do they respond? So usually um, most, most youth are eager to attend and know more. Um, they know more than what they knew prior to attending the group. So they're more aware. So I had a youth come in um, one group and was able to use what she learned in group to spot out what she thought was an exploiter that she seen on the train by um, looking for the red flags um, she learned about in the, the previous group. And uh, she said, if it wasn't for the prevention group, it she would have not been able to recognize those signs. So um, she, was, she was really excited about just being aware and being able to recognize that. And I'm gonna just kind of expand on this question a little bit um, for those, and we know that, um, you know, anyone can really be trained um, to run these groups. But how do girls respond to a survivor being part uh, running the group? I think that's important for people to know. Yeah, so, um, you know, usually the youth are very, they can be standoffish in the, in the beginning or like, you know, asking, well, why am I part of this group? Um, is it because you know, you think I'm being exploited and we, we let them know right away, um, that's not the case. We think that all youth um, young girls should have, or um, female identified um, youth should have this uh, information because, you know, it's important. So once they hear that, and then they hear that 
you know, I'm a survivor or there's a survivor who is facilitating the group, you know, they, you can kind of see like those layers coming off and they want to know more. So they respond very well when they hear that there's a survivor um, faci facilitating. Uh, Kyle, do you want to share any, uh, your experience um, running the groups? What's it like when you facilitate a, a group? Is Kyle with us? I can't. No. Okay. All right. So that means, Ken, I'm putting the pressure on you. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes here because I know you do have a lot. Um, so the question that I have for you is, which is a three part, what has been your experience implementing the prevention solution model? What has gone well? and what has been challenging? So just by way of background, uh, Valley Youth House is a relatively large agency. We serve primarily adolescents 16 to 21 throughout the state of Pennsylvania. My part is in the Eastern part of Pennsylvania, but uh, we do all kinds of programming. Um, we also support families, but primarily adolescents in the, in the foster care system. So about five years ago, uh, we began to see much more evidence of CSEC. And it's not to say that it wasn't there already, uh, we just became much more aware of the issue. Um, so, so as was the case, uh, we became very reactionary to what we would do, right? So, you know, we were trying to deal with the, the issues after they had already occurred. So it took us a little while to figure out, you know, we needed a system. Uh, we needed a way uh, to address prevention um, as well as assessment and, and treatment, which is which something we were very much trauma-informed. Uh, but but we weren't specifically set up to practice for CSEC youth. Um, and I think that if you look at our population anywhere, especially in our shelters, we have a couple of shelters that serve youth uh, 12 to 18. Uh, many of the youth, uh, upwards of 40 or 50% have experienced some sort of CSEC um, uh, interaction, right? So they've had this in their background and their trauma manifests in ways that, that are consistent with that. So. So we set about to try to put a process in place um, and in working through the process, we found my life, my choice. So uh, our lead clinician went and did the training and then you know, a few of us followed afterwards and we, we, we came into partnership and decided to implement the model. So I think what's been the, what's really been the benefit is that this is an evidence-based model. You know, we were trying to do this on our own. Um, you know, we had some decent ideas, but we did not have the same level of experience uh, that, that the My Life, My Choice folks had. So it gave us a framework to really talk about the youth we're serving, uh, the issues they're seeing, and it really focused much more on prevention. We were, like I said before, we were very reactionary. Uh, how do we get folks involved to do treatment? And we talked about TFCBT and some of those things that we use to try to treat youth who experience trauma, but we didn't really have a prevention model at all. So the use of groups um, and then the education of our staff. So we have some facilitators who are trained and we're rolling this out to all of our staff um, that are involved in housing. So that's anywhere from the shelter where we have youth that come right off the street uh, all the way up to our housing programs where youth can be with us for a couple of years if they're in foster care. So having a model that's consistent that goes from prevention to intervention to you know, we even have used the welcome back checklist, which is part of the uh, part of the model. So it really is a comprehensive way to look at the youth. The other thing that really has been helpful for us, and we knew about survivors, but we didn't know about the importance of survivor mentorship and involving survivors uh, in the process. So running groups, uh, having someone to talk to, uh, as was said earlier, having a survivor involved in the program is hugely different. I mean, we can talk to youth and we relate well, but we don't relate from that level. So, so that has been a huge benefit for us as well. Some of the stuff that's gone well, like I said, I think it's, um, it's really having a consistent model that's evidence-based. It has raised awareness within the agency. So myself and the lead clinician were trying to push this protocol. Uh, it doesn't have as much oomph uh, as having my life, my choice behind us. So having a, that model has really helped raise awareness. Um, it has helped us get people to back off from everything as trauma to there are specific forms that we need to address as it relates to CSEC. So, 
So that has gone really well. Um, the implementation of survivors um, in the program, uh, it's subsequent to all of this happening with rolling out the model. Uh, we also got a grant from the Department of Justice to start a residential program for female identifying survivors. So <laughs> needless to say, uh, the model has been usually helpful there about how we would run the program, uh, how we would hire. Uh, we've been looking to hire survivors part of the program, so that's been usually beneficial as well. So having the consistent model, uh, the prevention piece that we really hadn't done, we did a little bit, we created sort of a, an education piece, but it wasn't nearly as comprehensive incorporating groups, also partnering with local agencies. Uh, we have across our service area agencies who, who have survivor-based um, programs who can help us with mentorship when we have youth who identify and youth who need that help. So really that's going well, the awareness, the, the focus on prevention and having this entire comprehensive framework has gone really, really well for us. So having the training, uh, training facilitators so that they know uh, my Life, My Choice has now become part of our curriculum for CSEC training on a yearly basis. Uh, so all of our staff will receive this. Um, so it really gives us a basis to uh, see the signs, to identify, uh, to communicate across our team. So we have a multifunctional team. We have, we have clinicians that are involved. We have life skills counselors. We have resident advisors. All these folks can now communicate with a standard language, right? And they all can be aware of the signs of exploitation um, that they probably weren't as aware of before. What has gone not so well? Um, we have busy folks and it's hard for them to focus on anything specific. And they, like I said, trauma tends to get lumped into a pile. Uh, so so CSEC feels like part of that. So separating that level of trauma out and the intervention identification has taken some time. Uh, the programs that I'm responsible for are probably the largest housing programs in the agency. Uh, at least as it relates to uh, transitional living and uh, youth that spend some time with us. So we were a little bit ahead of this. So rolling it out to, um, it's not all 450 of us, but it's a lot of staff that need to receive the training and be aware um, that there's specific ways to deal with, with CSEC youth. Um, so that part has been a challenge, um, but it's beginning to roll out through the whole agency. Uh, so that, that has really been helpful for us. And we've had a lot of support from a training and facilitation perspective from My Life, My Choice. So that's, that's been hugely beneficial as well. So, so what's going well? Consistent model, um, raise of awareness, survivor in, uh, involvement, uh, focus on prevention rather than reactionary stuff, which is what we were doing. Um, what's been hard is we're a big agency and getting this, this awareness and rolling it out to the whole agency uh, has taken a little bit of time. Uh, but it's something we're working on and we're, we're looking forward to it being the kind of the practice standard uh, for Valley Youth House. Thank you. And I, I heard you say the welcome back checklist. Yeah, I love that. Yes, <laughs> yes, because that's so important. That's so yeah, important. So, Do you want to take a minute? to? Absolutely. So, so we, um, in our shelters, we have a lot of youth who will uh, leave the shelter, be absent from care. Uh, and we had a way to welcome them back. Uh, but the welcome back checklist for us has been a very plain language, youth focused, uh, concerned about needs rather than where they were and what they were doing. It gets to that, uh, but it's a very easy way to say, hey, listen, we know you were gone. There are reasons for that. Um, let's talk about how you feel. What can I do for you? Do you need anything? Are you okay? And then more gets into, hey, what could we have done better or what? What, how did you survive when you were out there? And what, what can we do with the program that would make it easier for you to stay with us? Um, and this has been really important when we talk about starting a residential program, because we haven't done it before, right? We have, we have houses, but we don't have one that's specific to CSEC survivors. So we know that we're gonna see those sorts of, you know, absent from care behaviors all the time. So being able to, provide a community welcome back, right? That's kind of what we look at it. It's like, you, you know, you're part of us, you were gone, but now you're back. So how do we help you to stay longer, you know, to stay out of the life a little bit longer than you did the last time? So it really changed the perspective because like I said, we deal with foster care youth and they, you know, they're in and out, but they, they pretty much stay with us. They don't, they, don't, they don't leave that way, right? So for us to have a way to ease the youth's transition back to us has been usually helpful as well. So. So we, um, in the state of Pennsylvania, there's uh, specialized settings and, and there, our 
our programs are being qualified too of the shelter and then also the residential facility as a specialized settings for trafficked youth. So it has specific protocols that we have to follow and ways we need to do training. Well, all of that is kind of undergirded by what we have with My Life, My Choice, including the welcome back checklist. So that's been very helpful in certifying us as a specialized setting for trafficked youth. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. I just wanted people to understand that piece too with when working in prevention, how, how helpful that is. Absolutely. And Kyle, for you, how can people listening today get more information or get involved? So if people are interested in learning more about our work, um, everything is on our website and we invite you to take a look at that. We have our prevention page, we have our training page. Um, all of our prevention trainings and all of our trainings are listed there with all the information of when they're happening um, throughout the coming year. Um, there's also news announcements about CSEC and other prevention efforts. Um, and please feel free to email us directly and reach out and we will always get back to you. We will, we're happy to answer any questions and provide any information that would be useful for you. Um, we are also currently taking applications for the second year of our Prevention Solution Fellowship, which Ken and Valley Youth House are participating in. Um, which is for female serving congregate care around the country. We'll be selecting five organizations um, to receive all of our training, consultation on survivor leadership, policy development and running prevention groups, um, as well as networking with other organizations who are doing similar work around the country. Um, and the fellowship period is 12 months starting in July. And this is at no cost to particip participating organizations. Um, the application periods open until April 9th on a rolling basis and information for that is on both of the both the prevention and the training pages of our website. Thank you so much, Kyle. So now what I want to do, um, and I, I just want to thank um, our panelists, um, who I'm sure now will take the time to answer some of your questions. Um, and so um, let's start. I saw and I said, I saw you responded. Okay. I, I'm based in the UK where the criminal justice landscape is different from the US for many reasons. I'm skeptical of law enforcement responses to complex social problems. I've also just been reading data on police. Oh my God, I'm getting tongue tied. Um, predators, pre, pre, Okay, let me say the word for me, please. Per perpetrators. Perpetrators of DV and perpetrators like sports coaches who position themselves with access to vulnerable victims. Um, is criminal law the best solution to CSEC or are we measures, or are measures to tackle poverty, housing shortages, poor educational achievement, more more effective, particularly given the very limited financial resources available to address this issue. And so who would like to take this question on our panel? I guess I, I, I can, Audrey, if it's helpful. Yes, from a thank you. Law enforcement perspective. Um, so uh, I guess first and foremost, um, we, and I can only speak for here in Massachusetts from a law enforcement perspective, right? We take a, um, a victim centered approach and it is not a law enforcement only process. We use something called an MDT, a multidisciplinary team. And the whole concept is to meet victims where they are. And I, I, I mean that, um, I have to be clear. It's been a number of years, um, since we, as a, um, and it's late coming that we as a group in law enforcement here in Massachusetts um, have had the wake up to say that individuals who are being trafficked and call them victims and not treat them as perpetrators of a crime, they're being exploited um, and they are, they should be seen that way. And uh, we as a society and law enforcement being a player in that should address it that way. And so, um, Going back to 2012, our office hasn't um, no no minor, um, and very rarely um, does it ever come up in the state where adults are charged, at least in our purview, with that as a crime. Um, and it's usually 
to the end of getting services in place and then dismissed. But certainly no, no minors are ever charged. The idea is, again, to meet victims where they are and to make it a more holistic process, <clears throat> which is to say we, we, we meet uh, with the victim, not just us, but members of the Department of Children and Families, My Life, My Choice, specially trained uh, coordinators and groups to really figure out what the needs are, the social, emotional, financial needs of the individual in the front of us and pivot to that. If a criminal case generates out of that, that is that is a byproduct, but that's not what we're there for first and foremost. We're there first and foremost to address the needs of the victim. And if the needs of the victim are met in addition because there's a, a desire to move forward in the criminal justice process, we will do that. But that is not um, the reason we're initially there. And that is different from pretty much every other unit or every other way we approach things uh, as a general rule. Um, and um, survivors of CSEC um, are obviously, everyone here feels the same way, incredible people. And um, they become the focus of the investigation or the process that is in front of us. And it shouldn't be about, we, we want to make sure that people exploiting survivors um, are not um, out in, in public and that they're held accountable. But that is the second address. Um, as to your other question about um, domestic violence, um, I'll say men in positions of power um, abuse that power regardless of whether they're police officers, sports coaches. Historically, whether I had a, a child abuse case involving um, a coach or a police officer, it's about power and control. And that power and control doesn't have come in any kind of shape or size. It is across the board. Um, and we, we hold all those folks accountable um, it, here in the, in the Commonwealth, and so, or at least in Suffolk County. And so uh, I say that um, it is something that needs to be addressed. And I think it's recognized, at least here, that, and, and treated as, um, as something that is, a, I'll say, an aggravating factor because um, we're putting trust and faith in someone in that position of power to do the right thing. And so it is even more a deviation from the norm when they, those individuals exploit it. Um, and the criminal justice system tries to use the information and data before us to prioritize those offenders, uh, which we should be spending more time on and, and look at individuals that are alternative to our incarceration um, and um, as well as diversion from the process so that we are focusing on those that have the greatest impact and people in positions of trust are those individuals where our time and effort is geared towards that impact. Thank you so much, Luke. And um, thank you for being here. And Luke is one of our board members and he also heads up our male ally initiative. So My Life, My Choice, uh, Luke is part of our My Life, My Choice family. Um, next question, um, this question is for Ken. Do you find that youth stay longer in housing situation where the staff have been trained in CSEC? Yeah, I, I don't know that I have statistics that'll support that, but I do know that that for our youth, that they feel uh, that you're they're cared for in a way that's understanding about what their circumstances are, that generally works out better. Um, I, like I said, I couldn't give you a percentage of youth who stay longer, but um, being able to provide a platform where they can talk about their issues and some level of understanding uh, certainly helps them stay across whatever the, whatever the trauma is, that, that's helpful. So in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it is. I couldn't measure it for you, but I, I would guarantee you that that would be the case. Thank you. Kyle, this question for you. We have been doing groups online and in person. How do you feel about the effect, effectiveness of Zoom slash video groups? That's a great question. So we were able to make a move at the end of the summer last year um, to develop a guide that allows um, groups, our prevention groups, to be run online. Um, and so far, groups that have run since that time, I think it's about half of them that have run in a remote format versus in person. And so that just depends on you know the um, the situation at the program and in the state where they're running. So um, if a program is kind of self-contained and and the kids are together physically anyway, in terms of COVID safety, and the staff are there, um, then a group can be run in person. Um, 
but we know in so many situations that's not possible. So we developed this guide. Um, so far, what we've seen is that online groups are just as effective as in-person groups. Um, something that we were concerned about as adults was kind of attention spans and the um, the level of interest, you know, holding the kids' interest when they're online versus in person. <laughs> Um, and we found that that's because we're old and the kids are so much more used to being online than, than most adults. So that really wasn't an issue. And we've been able to connect with the kids. Um, we had two online groups that ran with my life, my choice group over the groups over the summer. Um, Sherelle and I each co-facilitated one of those groups. And we really were able to connect with the kids. And we've heard the same thing from facilitators around the country who have run remote groups. Thank you, Kyle. And you're so on point. Uh, the young people, we're the ones that panic, as you say. The young people, they've really, they jump right on. We run tons of, aside from the My Life, My Choice groups, leadership groups, like things, a holiday party that we didn't think would work out online. The kids jump right on. It doesn't, it's, it's there now, right? So we're the ones, I think, as Kyle said, struck, Kyle said, we're the ones who thought it would be a struggle. Uh, next question too, Kyle, uh, for you is, why is the focus only on female identifying people? Aren't males also at risk of being exploited? They are, of course. Um, and this is a question that comes up frequently with our curriculum because it is designed to be used with female identified youth. Um, the reason for that is that the experience of exploitation um, for someone in a female body who is female identified is very different from the experience of exploitation um, for someone who is male identified. And we're not um, trying to avoid working with boys. We're not ignoring the situation that's very dire for boys who are male identified youth and LGBTQ youth who are at very high risk of exploitation as well. Um, but the curriculum was designed specifically to address the experience of exploitation in a female body, um, which is a very widespread issue. Um, so that's just our focus. Um, we know that there's a high need for um, similar curricula that work with boys. Um, and we do partner with other organizations and talk to a lot of other people who are doing that work. Um, so that's that's, that's our focus um, and it's not to exclude, it's more just to target the efforts that we're making. Thank you, Kyle. Another question for you, Kyle. Wondering about the 18 to 24 population, this group is that transition age youth that are vulnerable to CSEC, CSEC victimization, but have aged out of youth service, services system. Wondering if there's any active dialogue around explaining the focus age of CSEC beyond 18? Yes, so we have been uh, talking about that among ourselves as well. Um, and again, our, our prevention curriculum is intentionally um, uh, set up to uh, address the needs of youth age 12 to 18 um, for a number of different reasons. But we do know, uh, working with a number of kids who are um, aging out of care, who we know that that age is extremely vulnerable. When a child leaves the care of the state, leaves the child welfare system, they're at risk for so many things for so many different reasons. Um, and exploitation is, is a, a big one on that list. Um, so we have just started a conversation recently about making an effort to work with those kids in, a, in another very targeted way, the same way we have designed our curriculum um, for 12 to 18 year olds. Um, and we recognize that a number of our partners do work with older youth. Um, and so we will, we will be working on that. Uh, it's actually going to be part of our new three year strategic plan that's currently being developed. Thank you. And Kyle, this other question is similar, but I you know, it says, what about the boys, which we always hear, but we, you just touched on that. What about LGBTQ plus youth? Like, yeah. Yeah. So our, our mentoring program, which Sherelle mentioned briefly, our survivor mentoring program, um, we do have youth in our mentoring program who are identified in, in a number of different ways, in all ways, um, whether that is female identified, cisgender, transgender, transgender boy, cisgender boy. Um, and so we do work with youth in that capacity program. Um, 
again, our uh, prevention curriculum is, is designed to address the experience of exploitation for female identified youth, but that does include transgender, cisgender, um, youth who may have experienced exploitation while identifying as female, but currently identify as male or as non-binary. Um, so it, it is broad in that sense. Um, but we do know that the experience of exploitation um, for LGBTQ youth also differs. And so that's something that it is, it needs its own targeted prevention as well. Um, so that is something that, again, we are also working on expanding what we offer um, to include that. And so that is, that's something that's coming up as well. And this is a great question. Someone asked, are children that have been apart from CSEC being monitored closely once released from CSEC, once they come out of the life? Sherelle, I'm gonna I'm I'm turn that question over to you. Yeah, so once coming out of the life, um, you know, they're paired with a mentor and they continue to um, stay involved with that mentor as long as they want um, services. So currently I have a youth, I have a youth that um, I had since she was 14 and she's now 21. Um, so as long as they, they wanna continue in services, um, you know, we still do work with them. Thank you, Sherelle. Um, and I know that we have tons of questions that we might have to get back to you. Um, Kaylin will kind of take a look at those because unfortunately um, we've ran out of time, um, but I just wanna kind of do a quick wrap up. Um, first of all, I wanna thank the, the, the panelists. You guys did an awesome job, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to do this work without you. As you can see, we have folks from My Life, My Choice and folks from other areas um, who are doing this work because as Sherelle said, it's a community effort and, and the community doesn't just belong in one state. It's a worldwide, right? It, worldwide, we have to support these, these youth across the country. Those of us who do this work, we know that this is happening in the US, but it's funny how there are so many people who think that this isn't an issue that things like this happen to you know, kids from foreign countries. And our work around prevention, we have to prevent our children um, across the country from being exploited. And one of the things I wanna to add to that, when I think about across the country, I just wanna um, probably say that the My Life, My Choice prevention curriculum is used in 32 states across the country and we're shooting for all states and also in Canada. And we should all, you know, be working on preventing youth from being exploited. So with that, I do want to, before I let uh, folks go, um, as I said earlier, this is um, part one of a three part series. Uh, part two of this series is taking place on Wednesday, April 7th at 12 p.m. Eastern. And um, we'll speak to the question um, around access, access to pornography, uh, how pornography has skyrocketed. What does this mean for those watching it and those exploited through it? And join us by registering at the link in the chat. Caitlin will put that link in the chat. The other webinar that I want to announce, if, there are, uh, if you are a survivor or work with survivors or want to work more closely with survivors, here's a plug for our upcoming survivor leadership webinar on March 31st. I'll be hosting that webinar called More Than, more Than We Started, Growing as a Survivor Leader um, and My Life, My Choice. Uh, employs more survivor leaders than any CSEC organization in the country. I'll be moderating a panel of My Life, My Choice survivor leaders who will answer questions, share information about their leadership journeys, um, and watch your email um, for this important information. And uh, that will be a series as well, but the part, part one of this series I just announced all are welcome. I think this webinar will be very helpful for those who are thinking of hiring survivors and, and survivors as well. So please 
make sure I like to see a room, you know, full of providers and survivors because I think um, both parties will get a lot out of hearing um, how we employ um, our survivors uh, at My Life, My Choice and how it's all connected with prevention as well because our survivors also do a lot of prevention. And so I want to thank um, Catherine and Ken so much for taking the time out to join us for this part one of this prevention series. Um, it was just so great to hear you. Sherelle, big shout out to you and Kyle, our director of prevention. Um, and these two women uh, head up our prevention department. And, um, you know, it's what we have to do and we need to implement this in all of our communities across the country. And again, I wanna thank everybody and everyone have a great afternoon and hopefully we'll see you all at part two. Have a good one.